50% that are registered, half of them don't vote. Only 25% of evangelical Christians vote. That's crazy. There are so many more liberal Christians than you think. My okay. church is no. filled no. with <laughs> liberal Christians. <laughs> you get like a non-denomination. Yeah. yeah. See, like, why. so like, when you can't say the majority of people, well, yeah, but you're kind of on rally. Yeah, as overall. Yeah, like, you but, have a Lutheran, Catholic, yeah. Baptist church. Who's not yeah, yeah, but like other ones, you're going to okay. pay for the sake of time. Yeah. Next slide. Um, I'm not able to go to this, but this Friday, uh, Yaddle High College Republicans United, which is brand new, is having some kind of block, uh, homecoming block party from 4 to 7. Uh, Rick's going to be driving up there, so if any of you guys want to go with them, go for it. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, Rick can tell you more about it if you're interested. But it is a fairly new club up there. Uh, I think right now we're not even having our own meetings. We're partnered with the Veterans Club up there. So yeah, hopefully we can grow and get another campus going. So every Wednesday we try to table from two to 10. And uh, recently it's just been me and for safety reasons, I don't really like table alone after seeing what happened in UC Berkeley with that kid tailing that punch in the face. So. Um, if any of you guys would like to come and join, you guys can get volunteer hours for it and that can help you become an actual uh, voting member. Um, we do it for every Wednesday from 10 to two. You don't have to stay the whole time. Like I leave in the middle for classes and other people will pick up for me. So just feel free to hit me up or go on the crew Facebook group chat and have some fun tabling. Do you wanna explain this? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna give you the rundown of what happened here. Um, someone from Turning Point's corporate office reached out to one of our uh, friends that works with crew pretty closely, and wanted to get my contact information, and that person wasn't comfortable just giving my information to a random person, so they asked if it was um, all right to um, turn that over. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to bring me and possibly other people to come with me on Monday at three o'clock to the Turning Point headquarters to have a private meeting with them. Now, what's going on on that day, day is you're gonna have um, Trump Jr. and Charlie Kirk who's also gonna be there. I don't know what to what capacity. I don't know if we're just gonna be one of like a dozen people in the room or if it's gonna be like us in a small room where you get to come, like talk to uh, Trump Jr. But that's a possibility. So this is at three o'clock on Monday. If anyone wants to go, I need to know who is available so I can put you on the, the RSVP list because they, for security purposes, they wanna know who's coming into the room. So if you're interested in that, uh, text me, PM me on Facebook, but let me know that if you're interested and then suit up if you go. Okay, so we hit the halfway mark, guys. We're almost there. Um, upcoming meetings that we have, we have the Halloween meeting, we have Congressman Gosar, uh, we have ICE, and then that weekend, so November 13th is the Wednesday meeting, but that weekend we're gonna be going to the uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor point of entry for a Border Patrol field trip. If you guys haven't signed up already, please hit me up because it's due November 1st and you need to get a background check before you can go, so let me know. Uh, then after that, we have Dana McCarthy, and then November 27th is Thanksgiving, or the week of, so there'll be no meeting, and then December 4th, we have crew club elections, and then we will be done. That's just the Border Patrol field trip. Do you need to collect information from anyone who wants to go? Um, I've texted everybody who signed up. Um, I know you said you wanted to go after the club. I will bring out the slip and we can get that all figured out. Does anybody else want to go that hasn't signed up already? I know Rose has, um, a few others that aren't here has. You, you said you couldn't go. Anybody else? You have to be a US citizen. You wanna explain there. what that is? Yeah, so we wanted to do a actual border trip, but that's a long drive. So I reached out to uh, Border Patrol and asked them first to come to campus. And they said because of what happened at U of A, they didn't really wanna to come to campus and cause uh, a ruckus. So they then invited us to come to their Phoenix Sky Harbor point of entry, which is kind of overlooked because you know there is a lot of traffic with Phoenix being such a big city going in and out and they see a lot of things. So we're gonna go and get to see like how they run things there, what you see in an average day. Should be a pretty fun trip. And then this, um, we're gonna do a protest against communism uh, either on the morning of Gosar or McCarthy's meeting. We would like to table with other Republican groups like Turning Point USA. Um, so that way we can just kind of, you know, piss off the YDSA and all of them. Uh, if any of you guys want to become like a crew ambassador and reach out to them because we've got a lot on our plate right now with other stuff, 
We're going to try to see if we can get like non uh, ASU clubs to come also, like if any, like the Patriot movement or someone else besides us is there. Or so like writers. How I envision it is you have that field of uh, flags, students walking by, and then a bunch of tables around it with, you know, I want to see Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong flags. I want to see all sorts of like literature about communism, Antifa, and YDSA, and why they're all a bunch of alt left organizations, and then condemn ASU for tolerating that behavior of why they dox our members and then doesn't do anything about it, but if we say something controversial, they go after us. Total rant, but we want to have uh, this to be pretty successful. And since we only have like two or three weeks before these events that are taking place, we need to get on this like yesterday. So Nina wrote an article that was published on the Arizona Daily Independent, and she was also featured with uh, James T. Harris on KFYI. Um, and so we took what she wrote for that, and we sent it to the state press as kind of like a uh, counter argument to what was originally published about us, and they rejected it because it was 500 words or less, even though the other girls was also way over 1,000 words. But um, so we need to find somebody to write an opinion uh, article to counter what the state press said about us, but it needs to be 500 words or less. So if anybody would like to help out with that, that would be really appreciated. I think Rose, you would be really good for that. I'll, I'll screenshot. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Coda. I'm uh, kind of a friend of Rick's and uh, just uh, just kind of an activist in this area. So just a little bit about myself. Thank you for allowing me to come speak. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom invited me here today and uh, I'm just kind of thankful to be here. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am an activist here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, initially, I was, uh, I come from kind of born and raised in Prescott most of my life. I grew up there. I'm also part Native American, so I lived on the Indian Reservation. Uh, but I am very conservative. I'm also Republican. I'm a precinct committee man. And uh, yes, I'm also a registered <laughs> lobbyist. What else? Well, there's a bunch of other titles. Certified teacher, notary. <laughs> Let's keep adding to the list. Um, so, but I am, uh, just a little bit of background, uh, I graduated over, uh, I went to school out in Texas, and uh, just kind of majored in business, and then got, was already kind of doing politics. I've always been interested, I've always done student government types of issues, and then it wasn't until after college that I, uh, when I moved back to home to Prescott, um, I got involved with my Republican Party there, and I've just kind of been involved ever since. So. Uh, it was the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University College Republicans that kind of helped me out there and they kind of brought me in even though I wasn't, I already graduated from school, I was still, you know, able to work with them, became really good friends with them, still have a very good rapport with them as well. Uh, and then I uh, decided, hey, I kind of need to get some work. So um, I interned and got a job with Congressman Paul Gosar. So I worked with him for a few years. I was his congressional staffer working as a district aide. And basically I was doing constituent services, which means you are working with people like answering, their, answering the phone, answering the mail, and talking to people on a daily basis why, uh, why things aren't getting done in government. And you're also very helpful too. You can, you can actually do things in that office. It, you know, you have, it's a very, I would say, if you ever had the opportunity to, um, you know, volunteer or intern or work in a congressional office, I would say take it. It's probably like a once in a lifetime chance that you're gonna do that. Not many people get that opportunity and it's definitely gonna open your eyes, help you get connections. And I would definitely encourage her, if any of you are looking into that, I would do that. Um, afterwards, um, I moved down here to Phoenix two years ago. I started to work with Americans for Prosperity, which is a nonprofit uh, nonprofit group that they work on um, several policy issues. They also do grassroots activism. I don't know if they've come to this uh, group or not to speak. Uh, but they basically do activist training and then they also work in policy issues. And that's where I've kind of been doing some lobbying work. And uh, with Americans for Prosperity, I did leave them like two, a few months ago. 
Um, and I kind of focus on pol uh, school choice, policy, education. That's kind of my bread and butter. That's like my heartbeat. And um, that's kind of where I've been at now. So now I actually work with uh, what's called Prenda Schools, which is a micro school startup company. We're basically a, uh, we're kind of like a bunch of little homeschools in people's homes and in churches and in community centers. And there's like eight to 10 kids in the classroom. And basically we're just uh, bringing innovative options to uh, communities that don't have, that have limited school choice options. That's what we're doing. We are a private market solution. We are a free market solution is what I like to call us. I have this little free market pin right here. It's kind of, it's like the stock market. <laughs> but uh, it basically represents free market because we are free market solutions. And we believe that the free market can provide the solutions to our education issues that are going on. So, um, so I guess what I'm trying to ask here today, um, I'm asking for a few things here. Um, since I'm down at the Capitol, we do, we, I'm gonna be lobbying on a few issues. Uh, the first thing is I'm gonna be lobbying on education. Uh, specifically on education, are any of you familiar with the empowerment scholarship accounts? You're yeah. tiny, Shh. yes. So uh, this past session, we had empowerment scholarship accounts. Uh, we're looking to try to make some fixes that would allow more flexibility in this program for students who are going to school, uh, specifically for Native Americans, uh, who are having to go to school off the reservation, but happens to be outside of state, uh, but still within the bounds of the reservation. Specifically, there's an issue on the Navajo reservation that we're trying to resolve. And basically what I'm saying is that if you are willing to help with issues on school choice or if you're interested, I would greatly appreciate um, some help with that. What we normally do is we go down to the Capitol, we talk to legislators, and then we also try to bring awareness to the issue because policy isn't just talking to the legislator. Your legislator may agree with you on the issue. This happens more times than not. A legislator actually agrees with you. They, they will tell you to your face that they agree, but then they don't vote with you. And a lot of times they don't vote with you because public opinion isn't quite where you're at. So we talk about the Overton window a lot. Sometimes the Overton window, you and the legislator may be in agreement in the Overton window, but the public opinion is in the Overton window with you. A lot of times what you're doing as an activist, especially I know this with crew, is you're trying to bring awareness to issues. And you're trying to bring public policy to the people who are out there. Because a lot of people really don't think on this. We are kind of different in this front. We actually think about public policy. We think about taxes. We think about you know how how government impacts our lives, and we think about you know the ways that government regulations. I know some of us are interested in the Uber, Uber and uh, Lyft five dollar fee that's going on in the city council. Like we actually care about those issues, but most people probably don't care about those issues, and most people probably don't even think about it. Most people probably don't even know about it. You know, they they they'll realize six months from now when they actually go to the airport and they realize that you know using Uber costs them a lot more than it cost them last year. So that's, that's what people finally think about that. Um, so we do have some education policies. Uh, right now in the legislature, we have a pretty, uh, we have a very close, um, we only have one vote over in the Senate uh, for Republicans. So it always comes down to who wants to make a deal. <laughs> so pretty much you get a lot of people who have their wish list. And so that's what happens a lot. So I would ask that you would keep on your uh, legislators I don't know if you're registering in this district here, which is what, LD27? 26. 26, is yeah. that, and I'm not sure. We is have that all, Salmon? Yeah, all three of ours are Mendez. Democrat. Okay. We've got Salmon and Blanc in representation, so and Mendez in Senate. Let me, let me give a little tidbit on Salmon. <laughs> I met with Salmon last session, and she's, she's, she's pretty, uh, she's very progressive. <laughs> and uh, I don't know when I talked with her if anything I said even like was getting to her. Um, I mentioned, because I'm, I'm actually from a school district, uh, where my reservation is at, that received $21,000 per, stu uh, per student in funding. This was last year, now it's eight, like 17,000. But when I told, and they're also an F-rated school district, like they only have F-rated schools. Um, when I told her that, she looked at me straight in the face and says, it's because they're poor, they need more money. I was kind of astounded by how she just like, it was a talking point, it wasn't even like, there was no logic, there was no reasoning, it was just a talking point that like, came out of her mouth. And that always kind of made me pause when working with her, so if you are working with her, just take note 
take that and just know that that's possibly she she she's she has an ideology that's driving her. And I would just say that when you're talking with her, um, I would just mention you know just you got you got to figure out the framework. I think one thing if you're working with legislators or if you're trying to figure out who you're talking to, you need to know your audience. Is what I'm really stressing here. You need to you need to understand your audience and you need to understand the framework of what they believe. Me and Representative Salmon don't have the same framework of beliefs. We don't have the same worldview. Me and Mendes don't have the same worldview. Me and Isaiah LeBlanc don't have the same worldview. So I think it's really key that you understand who your audience is and you need to understand, you need to talk in that language that they understand, but you also need to be able to, um, you need to understand what's going to appeal and what's going to, what, what drives them. Because a lot of people don't really take that into consideration. Um, that's just kind of my little tangent there. Um, so we do have other issues that I really care about are like March for Life. I'm a big pro-life person. Uh, so I definitely go out, this will be my third year that I'm going out to DC and I'll be going out there. So if anyone wants to come join, you kind of have to pay your own way because I pay my own way. Uh, but if anyone's interested in teaming up and doing March for Life, uh, I will be going out there in January and then I just go talk to some of the legislators about passing good policies, passing uh, pro-life policies, and then you go stand out in the cold like for eight hours <laughs> and freeze, but it's, it's fun. So, uh, and the other item I have here is um, we do need more people. I appreciate what you're doing here, Rick, is just engaging people. You're taking those policy fights to people who probably don't really think of it. Um, I tend to do a lot of my policy fighting on Twitter and social media, as some already know, uh, but I would appreciate you follow me on Twitter and social media. It's just my name, Jeremiah Coda, on both on Facebook and uh, Twitter. You can just follow me, and I would gladly appreciate that. Um, and I do want to talk one more issue here, um, and I do want to say thank you. If you did help us out on the light rail, I do want to appreciate if you helped us out on light rail. Um, we, I was part of that campaign. I was a uh, uh, pretty instrumental in there, and we, we did lose. <laughs> we took a good beating in that campaign, but it's, it's a good way to learn lessons, but this, it, it's also a way to pivot um, in the city of Phoenix. So yes, it is a Democrat city, yes. Uh, Republicans are outnumbered. Uh, you know, Republicans are outnumbered. Uh, we lost this pretty handily, uh, but I will tell you, I'm actually south from South Phoenix. I don't live right along Central Avenue, but I live on 27th Avenue. Uh, but the main thing was, for me, this was about those businesses that are currently there that will suffer from the city moving their light rail of four years of construction may put some of them out of business. I mean, the city's just picking with winners and losers for what? You know, light rail is efficient, it, you know, it costs a lot of money. We have other things like Uber and Lyft. You know, we may have autonomous vehicles soon. So this is just the city liking a big, you know, their central planning, liking big projects like spending. Uh, you know, there's contractors that benefit. You can look at the campaigns, the campaign resources from the other side, they had like straight up just construction companies giving to them. <laughs> so it, it's no secret, uh, but the, the, you know, we, we lost that one, but I will tell you there was some good news. The precincts that were right along Central Avenue in South Phoenix actually voted with us, not by much, but they did vote with us. That's because they saw the impact that, the negative impact that it would have directly on them. But again, the broader picture outside of that small area was people just aren't connected to the ideas. And this is one thing that I ask that we all can do is how people show how government really does affect them. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people just says, oh yeah, light rail, sure. But they really <coughs> don't think about people who are being impacted in that specific area. They just think it's a good, feel good project and the disconnect of actual impacts or consequences sometimes don't always register. So I think that's a good thing to uh, bring to light. Yes. <clears throat> Do you know what the turnout was in that election by register? What percentage of registered Democrats voted and what percentage of registered Republicans voted? I don't know that number. The only, I do, the numbers I do know, I can say for sure say are that there was more, uh, this was the highest voter turnout for the <coughs> highest number of votes in an issue campaign, so there was no candidates. So, and then, and, and the only other one is that I know that there was more votes than in the mayoral runoff. So there's there was a lot of interest in this. I just don't know exactly that number. And did, 
did you get any help from the Arizona Republican Party, like Kelly Ward and Mike Shaw, they, to help get out the vote, they, or have precinct committeemen from around the state to make get out the vote for the Phoenix voters? I don't know. I honestly don't know if they directly did themselves. I know they were gap. They did give us some support using some of the resources, like the, the campaign sidekick. So that was very helpful. So that just helps us. Uh, and then I, I do think some, like, I guess the people who were helping us were all Republicans mainly. So I, I can't say they didn't help us, but I think they did have some people going out there. Some of the LDs were a little bit more helpful than others. And then I think messaging wise, I think they were, we were kind of on the same page. We weren't getting like direct resources though. Let uh, me give you an example. If, <clears throat> I would have made phone calls. I don't live in Phoenix, I live in Tempe. If someone would have come to me and said, Dan, we need you to make 30 phone calls. These will be targeted to Republicans who don't normally vote in this kind of an election, mm -hmm. the lower propensity mm -hmm. voters. And everybody, and every other uh, precinct committeeman in the state is gonna be asked to do the same thing. You'll be able to do it from home, uh, you know, on your computer. I'd have done that. Um, what if you know, we have about 5,300 precinct committee on statewide in the Republican Party now? If, if they'd all made 30 phone calls, that would have been over 150,000 phone calls to, to voters who don't normally vote in this kind of election. Do you think that would have made a difference? I think it could. I mean, I mean, our numbers were still pretty. We were, I think, it was like 37. I believe so. I mean, we were still there's a lot of gravity <coughs> on the percent wise, but I mean, I don't see it hurting. So you um, 63 to 37 was your loss. Right? I, believe, I believe that's where it was ended up around. So it was it was a pretty heavy loss. Okay. Um, but I mean, I think I think our issue was our biggest issue was not just messaging, but a lot of people just did not see the connection. I think a lot of people just says, well, we're gonna lose the money. There was a lot of information that was out there that wasn't true. And it's hard to be, I honestly don't know how the other side wants some days, because I, I didn't see them turn out either. Like, I didn't see their machine really hanging out, but apparently people just aren't necessarily, I don't think people are in agreement with us on this issue. I think people really do kind of like your public transportation at the end of the day. That was kind of my takeaway, so. Yes. Well, on that note of liking public transportation, I'm going to play devil's advocate in favor of the light rail. <clears throat> Going When riding the light rail, I don't have to sit through traffic, whether I'm driving the car itself or I'm in rideshare. So what's the problem with the light rail? So the problem with the light rail would be, so it's basically your cost. You're, you're actually receiving a net benefit. Like you're receiving like a, a benefit there compared to, like what you're putting into it is not, like the benefits you're receiving from it are greater than like what you're actually putting into it. And all the costs are shared with everyone else who don't, who doesn't use it. So like for me, I don't want ride the light rail, but I'm still having to pay for it. But you're the one that's receiving all the benefit, whether you know it every time you do ride it. So that- So should I stop riding it and stop supporting it? I mean, it's, it's, you know it's, I mean? it's there. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't- <coughs> it's at, like, at, I'm at, sorry, but if I'm, if I'm gonna, if I can get, you, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna have to choose between riding the light rail and you know taking my car or Uber to sit through traffic, I'm gonna take the light I mean, rail and not sit through traffic. I mean, it's there. I mean, I wouldn't you know? say don't use it. I mean, it's there. I mean, it is there. We we're not. We weren't asking to stop. We weren't asking to. Right, but I not just in general, right but like still right. extending it, but you're still. You could get to where it's extending Part, without so, sitting so, through traffic. So they're yeah. extending Part. it from what it currently is. <coughs> Right. Right. I know, but what I'm saying is now people can get to wherever they're sending it to without and, sitting through traffic. And our biggest. So you know that's a really heavy argument. Our our biggest our biggest push our biggest argument against that is the cost. When for, for the extension to South Phoenix, the cost per rider was going to be a hundred and forty-five thousand dollars per rider of tax money. Is so that per year? Per person. Okay. Per uh, for for the for the construction. Okay. We're saying. If you need public transportation, I think for 145K, you're probably better off deciding how you can spend that money rather than the government saying, we're gonna make it a train. So, 
that's that's really where this comes from. At 145k, I think, like literally, you could buy a car. Like that's that's the deal. Like you can literally buy a car. We can literally buy every rider who's using light rail a car instead of public transportation. I just can't bring myself to advocate against the light rail at all whatsoever because I'm sorry, but you you avoid traffic. You know, it's just like think of how it, efficient it, that it, is when you avoid traffic and you're not. You know, you, you're you're sitting in traffic for two hours, or taking the light rail, and it's only it's taking you're, thirty it's, to forty-five minutes. But you're receiving a very direct benefit from it, while everyone else is paying a cost for you. It's a subsidized cost. Is basically what it is. I mean, that's really what it is. It's a subsidized benefit to you. Um, I mean, I'm not saying don't use it. It's there. A lot of people do it. So a lot of people don't even pay. <laughs> so they're really receiving subsidized benefits, but it, but we were saying not to expand it. That's what we were calling for. We weren't calling for like totally taking no, it out No, I know, ground, but, but even not to expand it, I, I just can't get over the, Do you think you're getting, you're you're gonna be getting to where you're going, expanded or not. At, 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 right, you're basically subsidizing here? it though. Okay, so I yes. used to work for the Phoenix City Council and I can tell you the numbers on this. The light rail construction is not gonna be completed until 2050. We're going to have flying cars in Arizona scheduled for 2030. You're not getting you a joke, light rail. Don't joke with that. I'm not don't joking. joke me with the flying cars because I was actually going to get we really have, excited about that. We have we have we already have an agreement from Uber that they want to put flying car flying taxis here in 2030. The light rail will not be completed until 2050. We actually don't know how much the light rail costs because every time I ask for costs, it increased astronomically over three months their production has increased by 39%. In addition to that, there has never been a train that has been built on time in Arizona. So even with the projection of it being 2050, it's likely not gonna happen. There's a good chance that this light rail is never going to be completed and we're never gonna know how much it costs. And when our office asks them, how much is it going, why did it increase over 39%? And by the way, they took money from the Killed West Valley line and hit it into the two lines that increased by 39%, which they have not broken ground on yet. And when and when we asked them, why did you hide that money? Why didn't you even tell the city manager? They said, oh, because it's gonna be fine, because when the economy crashes, that's gonna reduce the cost of labor, and then we'll be able to afford the light rail. <laughs> Mother of all things holy. So the light rail is a complete boondoggle. It's never gonna be completed. They're gonna end up having to either kill some of the lines or kill our pensions because they can't afford both. And not only that, it's taken away from a large percentage of our funding for roads. And so right now, I think it's 70% of our roads, no, I'm sorry, 80% of our roads are um, under the 70% or better um, level of what the road is supposed to be. Like so, condition-wise, you yeah, mean? Condition okay, wise. I was so children. So yeah, 80% of our roads are under a 70% threshold on condition. So that's a C grade for our roads at the high mark right now. We can't afford the road. We can't afford the roads that we have today because of the light rail. Also, the money that we're supposed to get from the federal government only funds like this much of the light rail. The rest of it comes out of Phoenix taxpayer pocket. I, I think the bigger argument here is though, like, is a government's responsibility to transport you from point A to point B? My argument is no. And I believe that's what light rail does. I mean, we kind of have that with city roads and freeways and everything. I just think specifically with light rail, a lot of it has to come down on cost. That's really where I come down on is, I don't think government's role is to transport us from point A to point B at 145k per person. That was really, that's that's, <coughs> that's where it breaks down. I, I guess. I and, just can't, you know, completely be against it. I just, I can't. And, and a lot of people work, and a lot of people agree with you, and... I, uh, I'm just being honest, not trying to be antagonistic. It's that's just where I stand on that, <laughs> you know? Well, I, uh, I know. a lot of people saw it your way, so, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no, I, I can't really say more to that, because I think a lot of people definitely saw it your way, so, yes. This is the problem with like welfare spending and like and, um, entitlement spending. Um, I don't like these programs unless I'm getting it, and if I'm getting it, it's the best program ever. Right. I, that's how I look at it. Yeah, so, it was increased entitlement spending, so it's another good way to look at it. I would say, but, yes. I was gonna say, where'd you come up with that number? 
Uh, 145K. So that number comes from the amount of money that the city and the uh, feds were going to put into the project. Uh, and that's from the actual Metro Transportation Committee themselves. It was, uh, I don't even remember, it was like 1.2 billion, I think. I don't even remember now how much the number was, to be honest. So like over how much time does each person pay that much money? Like over how many years? So this was going to be, this is the money that the city already has through their tax and the feds are gonna put in, the feds already have. Uh, this is going to be just for the construction of the rail. So basically when you equate all the, this is just for South Phoenix. Let me just move, this is for the South Phoenix extension only. That's how much that cost is for. So, and I honestly I can't remember if it's 1.2 or 2 bill. To be honest, it, doesn't look like, it was a lot of money. <laughs> so, but that's where that, and that was from their own numbers too. That was, yes. Okay, wait, I know you don't live in Tempe. Uh -huh. So you, or anyone else in here, really honest. Um, what's your opinion on the, the building of trams in the Tempe, for example? That's literally happening right now. I would probably be opposed to it, just, so I, mean, I have two. I mean, I mean, in general, I'm probably going to be opposed Which to any city. They're building. literally doing it right now. If, if you've Something. noticed all the traffic, you know, Miller, Apache, that's the tram. Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, that made perfect sense. Let's put a huge train on the two lanes that we have. <laughs> that's not going to clog traffic. Yeah, who thought, who thought those were going to there? So. so there's something called um, complete streets that Tempe has adopted, and um, taking up the roadway to make it uncomfortable to drive on and creating traffic on purpose is right. what Complete Streets is. So that's what Tempe's doing, that's what Phoenix is doing. That's the whole point of it. That's why Phoenix created a train above the ground rather than putting it below the ground or in the sky, which they could have done. The whole point of it is to create traffic congestion so less people will drive. They want everybody to ride a bicycle. And that's, that's actually true. The other, when I was arguing with the campaign on the other side, News, you didn't watch the video. Her argument was that this would make people, this would force people, is what her words were, force people to ride their bikes and walk. <laughs> like, the, not my words, her words. So, right, exactly. And, and you know, I said, you know, we shook hands and walked out in the parking lot, and she, you know, she had her, like, no ride, you know, ride her bike sticker on her car. So, this is, this is literally, it is social engineering. This is really what this is. So for the light rail that's already completed, I know that it's never turned a profit from the money they've generated, uh, but what percentage of the maintenance of keeping it running, what percentage is, used, is paid for by itself? And what, what's the other part that's subsidized? None of, it, none of the light rail is paid for by itself. Um, it Not costs, even like 5% of it? No, no, it costs about, I believe it costs $100 million per mile. Well, you still have to buy a ticket to get on though. Yeah, but a ticket is a couple of bucks. There's no, you can have, you can have the, you can have the train at full capacity. So it's worse than Amtrak. You can have the train riding at full capacity and it will not pay for itself. Like 24 hour full capacity, it will and not pay And some people don't itself. without even buy, buying the $2. Oh, absolutely. Because the, the light rail is not like, you know, have, controlled by security very often. Have you read the Phoenix Eight Times? People get deported. <laughs> yeah, so, According to them. So the, way, yeah, the way that that works is that the, the police have um, set up traffic stops so that they just stop the train and then do a check and then bring people in. Um, they, it's called, the city hall, call, hall has nicknamed it Crime Express. So, because um, it's largely used by shoplifters um, to be able to get away with shoplifting. So there's light rail. Any other questions or issues? Candidate questions, maybe? Do a really good battle. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, so. When are you doing the lobbying stuff? So I do lobbying when uh, we're in session. Uh, and also, I guess, lobby sometimes happens if we're out of session, too. Like if you're just meeting with a lawmaker or something. But usually it's in session. Like we'll get a bill ready. And then uh, you kind of got to, you walk it through like a baby. <laughs> you got to walk it, like literally, you got to walk it through like mm -hmm. a baby because people can do all sorts of shenanigans. Uh, but you really do. Um, and then that, that kind of happens between January and May when session is in. And um, out of session, you're kind of taking some meetings on the side. But it's kind of a daily thing. And it's an interesting job. So 
Uh, but what we do, what I will ask is if you're on the list, like maybe if you could just help give us support, because a lot of this really isn't, it's not difficult to meet with a legislator, but they need support. Like they need to hear from their actual people within their district, uh, especially when you get those members who are just, they just, they can't, for whatever reason, they have other interests in mind. They do need support. A lot of them do need support. They need to know that constituents in their district actually support the bill. And if, especially if there's anyone here who has a special like connection to an item, like, you know, there's a bill on, I don't know, something, uh, <coughs> There's like a victim, victim, victim bill or something like that. If someone has a story to connect to it, that's always very helpful because that actually helps us when we're going down there. So like, this is going to impact real people in your district, and that's something that's always good. Like, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's going to come up this session, but um, <coughs> if there's anything I can, I will just. If anything, I will at least keep you informed and let you know what's going on, and just kind of keep you abreast of those situations, and then. You know, if you're interested and just want to say, hey, I, I think I can be helpful, let me know. And if I can just come tag along or something like that. So, yeah, what is your email on? Yes, I can email everyone or just okay. shoot out an email. Of course. So, so hopefully. This session started. So I it's, it's in January. January, okay. Mm -hmm. I was forgetting. I'm like, I don't even know when this starts. And then all of a sudden, I'm just like, oh, I get to in session now. <laughs> I always never, never keep track. Yeah, January, and then usually goes about May. May? Yeah. Oh, okay. May-ish. End of May-ish. So, that's Wait, it. Out of curiosity, what do they do from, like, June? <laughs> so, they do, they go back to their district. Oh, um, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, they go back to their district. They're in their district. It's just, a lot of it's just, some, some of them really do have, like, part-time jobs, so they work on the side. But okay. a lot of it is, you know, it's a lot of, it's kind of like networking, where they're just, Going to their uh, district functions, or they're kind of building a coalition. Basically, just uh, living life, doing whatever. Right, and a lot of them actually get invited to a lot of things. So a lot of the like policy and uh, kind of the think clubs out there, or the think groups out there, mm -hmm. they kind of like invite them. Uh, what's that big one that like Shauna Bullock got invited to recently? Oh, yeah, I don't Alec. Know. Yeah. Like Alec is like one of those groups that you know they'll fly them out. They're going out to be. They're going to Israel or I don't know. <laughs> you know. So um, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of uh, like things like that that happen in the off time. And there's still committee. There's still meetings down there. Yeah. Usually like some special committee hearing meetings. Right. I didn't think it was necessarily completely right. dead, but right. Okay, like there's right. no legislation happening. Right. So what are they? Yeah, because session is it's kind of like a count. It's kind of like a school year. It's like there's it's a very there's a start and there's an end and you have to have all of your all of your bill items within that time period. So it's like okay. it's kinda like a school calendar. Oh. So and I'm ready to wrap up. So Yeah, good. Yeah. So we're ready for the next cool. question. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you so much.